listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Six Figure Dog Business. I'm your host, Ty Brown, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us today. Now, today's show finds us with a repeat guest. Her information last time became so popular, we wanted to invite her back on. And today she's going to be teaching us how to immediately earn more money by packaging and setting up our programs properly. So stay with us, and we'll be right back with Molly Rouse. Sit. Day. We'll be right back after a short pause. Dyson. The new Dyson Animal Backs are powerful bagless upright vacuums for homes with pets. Air muscle and radio root cyclone technology generates the strongest suction power to powerfully remove dust, dirt, and pet hair from the home or car. To order your Dyson Animal Vac, go to DysonDeals.com. DysonDeals.com to order your Dyson Animal Vac today. Dyson. Music to your ears. Pet Life Radio, the number one pet radio network on the planet, joins forces with iHeartRadio to put the power of your pets in your pocket. Awesome. Download the iHeartRadio app and rock Pet Life Radio on your phone, on your tablet, on your Xbox, in your car. Pet talk, pet tunes, and fun pet times. Pet Life Radio and iHeartRadio. Positively possum. Let's talk pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, and we're back, and with us today, we've got a repeat guest. We've got Molly Rouse. Molly, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. So, for those that haven't heard your previous show or don't know who you are, can you give us a a quick little bio? Who is Molly Rouse? Absolutely. I'm also a professional dog trainer, but I am the co-creator of the Marketing System for Dog Trainers, which is a home study course for dog trainers, and the founder of the website MakeItAsADogTrainer.com, which has a bunch of free videos just for dog trainers on marketing their business and really how to make it financially as a dog trainer and make a fantastic living working with dogs, which is something we all love to do. What I wanted to talk to you today about was a system, because I remember way back you and I were chatting, and we were chatting about you know programs, and we were talking about how we thought that most dog trainers and for that matter you know pet sitters and dog walkers and groomers kind of go wrong when it comes to creating their programs and so help me understand here you've actually created a system to kind of help anyone understand how they can create their programs properly right Right, exactly. It's a seven-step system that I came up with to be able to help dog trainers based on their own businesses and how they want to set up their programs, what they can offer and what they want to offer, no matter what kind of setup they have with their business so that they can set up their programs the way they they want to do them, but they make a lot more money per client and they also attract more clients with their programs. Well, I think you're kind of answering the next question I was going to ask because I was going to say, you know, traditionally, you know, dog trainers, it was pay X and you get six group sessions or pay X and you get three private sessions or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you don't like that system is what you're saying. Well, basically, this does particularly apply to trainers who are offering either private lessons or maybe board and train type programs or day training or something like that. And there are lots of reasons why having programs for dog owners to choose from works much more successfully for dog trainers rather than just charging by the hour or by the lesson or throwing together a certain number of lessons for maybe a discounted package rate. And one of the big reasons is that if you charge by the hour or they can kind of easily calculate how much they're paying per hour of your time, then you're kind of viewed more like a commodity. They feel like they're paying for an hour of your time. And that makes it harder to charge what you're worth if let's say you're doing, you know, four lessons for $500. It seems like a lot. But with a well-designed program, the client feels like they're paying more for an end result rather than just for your time. It seems much more valuable. The other thing is if you just charge by the hour or by the lesson or, you know, by the lesson one at a time, a lot of families will quit too early. And not only will you as the trainer not make as much per client, they will tend to stop doing 
learning lessons as soon as they feel like they can kind of make it on their own from there. And often they'll really need more more help, but they'll try to continue on their own too early because they don't want to pay more. So they might do two or three lessons and then stop if they're paying per lesson. And then even if you charge as much as $100 an hour, many of the trainers that I've taught make well over $1,000 per client on average, even in lower income or lower population areas. So there's a lot of reasons, but those are just some of them. Okay. So it sounds like, hey, as long as we're going to go to the trouble of of getting a new client, which takes time and money and, and effort, might as well be getting the best value out of each client is what it sounds like. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So let's jump into it. So like I say, we've got seven steps. What is step number one? Step number one is basically to figure out what kind of program types that you can offer or choosing a program type. And what I mean by program type is do you want to offer group classes, private lessons, day training programs, board and train programs, or a combination of those things? If you're going to do group classes, do you have enough people contacting you to fill them up? If you're going to do private lessons, where can you do them? Can you do them at your place? Do you need to do them all in home? These are all things to kind of figure out first to just decide what type of program you can and want to offer. That's the first step. And now is this just entirely personal preference or when you're working with a dog trainer client, do you like push them in this direction and say, hey, you probably should do this or yeah, I mean, how do you determine which is best? It's going to be mostly based on preference and what the trainer is actually able to do. So if they don't have a facility or they don't have any means of working with clients at their home or anything like that, then a lot of times they're going to kind of naturally be falling right into doing private lessons in the owner's home because that just seems like the most logical option. But sometimes Mm -hmm. trainers like that can still have dogs at their house, maybe just one at a time. And will choose to maybe do one board and train program, but only take one dog at a time for their, their house and charge a lot more for that than they do for their private lesson programs. Okay. What's step number two? Step number two would be to choose a program style. And basically what that means is that most common program style is having programs stacked one on top of the other. I call this program stacking. A client would do the basic program first, most often, and then they'd come back and do an advanced program, hopefully. Although a lot of people tend to think after they did the basic program that they got enough and they just run with it from there. Or they think the training didn't work that well and they don't want to spend more on another training program. But this is the program style that most dog trainers start with because it's the natural inclination because this is the way a lot of other dog trainers do it. So it's just kind of copycatted. And the only upside to this style of program is that you're hoping to get repeat business from clients, but often you won't. And then you're not, again, maximizing your income per client because chances are a lot of them would have been willing to pay more if your programs had been set up differently. So another program style, for example, is what we call pick a size, which is you offer a small, a medium, and a large option, and then the client chooses how much they're going to get and how much they're going to spend. The largest program would include maybe more lessons or more access to you or more bonuses or more commands, unlimited things, more convenience, like you would go to their home instead of them coming to you, more days of training for a board and train program, all of the things that clients would find valuable. And a small program would include less of those things, which basically would mean that they would do more of the work and you as the trainer would do less of the work, which means you don't charge as much, but they don't get as much. Gotcha. Yeah. And and just kind of as an aside, we went to pick a size, you know, at my company several years ago, three, four years ago. And, and yeah, it was a huge difference to our bottom line. And so is that generally what you recommend pick a size versus stacking? Typically, yeah. The only exception to that is that if they do just group classes or something along those lines, sometimes it's easier to still do the program stacking where they have a basic class and then a more advanced class later. But for private lessons or or any of the other types of programs, typically the pick a size option for a style works much better. Okay, cool. And so uh, so we've got stacking, pick a size. Are those the two that you've generally seen out there as far as, you know, styles that people offer? Yeah, those are the most common. There are a couple others. There's one I also call the pigeonhole, which is kind of one a good example is a puppy program. If you have one puppy program and you have someone come in with a dog that's less than six months old, they only have one option. And if they mm-hmm. only have one option to choose from, then they're pigeonholed into only doing that program or not working with you at all. So that's another style. And that typically, there are lots of ways to work around that, even with puppy programs. So that's one style that I try to steer people away from. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So we've got, correct me if I'm wrong here, we've got type, we've got style. Is that the two? Okay. So what's step number three? 
Step number three is now that you've picked program types and styles, now you would want to write the features of programs that you would come up with. So I always recommend that everyone start with their largest program first. They create one that has so much value in it and every feature that they think would be valuable to their ideal clients. What commands might they want? What bonuses might they want? How many lessons would it include? What things could you add to it that would be considered valuable to your ideal clients? How can you give them more personal attention or more convenience? Is there anything else like unlimited things or lifetime support or anything like like that that they might not ever use, but will give them peace of mind and make the program more valuable to them? Training materials, including equipment, anything like that. And after coming up with what I call the kitchen sink program, everything but the kitchen sink, <laughs> now you would create a the smallest program, the bare minimum program, the minimum that your average client would need. Maybe it would be three lessons and five commands, or maybe it's a one day day training program with two private lessons afterwards, or maybe it's just a group class. And then you would maybe come up with one program in the middle. So that way you have three options to choose from that any of your ideal clients could come in and say, choose either the program that has more features and more convenience and more value or a smaller program where they might do more work. So features basically is the stuff. It's X amount of sessions, X amount of commands, X amount of time. I mean, am I getting that correct? Yes, exactly. The features would be what's actually included, uh, what the commands are, how many lessons it is. So let's say, you know, your smallest program might be three lessons and five commands, and this is what the commands would be, and all the lessons would be at your location instead of you traveling to them. And you just write out just what the features would be. Okay. Now, maybe I'm getting ahead of ourselves here, but do folks ever worry, you know, as they're putting this together, they're like, well, my features are going to be three private sessions and I want to charge X, but this guy across town has three sessions and he charges less. Do folks ever worry about that as they're putting together their features? Yes, absolutely. It's very common for dog trainers to worry about being compared apples to apples with other trainers because their programs are similar in size or the features. So that gets into a whole other part of marketing and making sure that they can stand out not only in explaining the benefits of their programs and the end results, that it's not just about what they get, the feature. It's not just about what you're giving them. It's about what they get in the end, which is the benefit. And that's where a lot of dog trainers, including everyone who's listening, all your competition, they're all usually going to to fail at explaining the benefits, the end results that they're going to be getting with the programs rather than just the features. And that's one thing that will really help you stand out as well as having a really great outline sales process. And that's a whole other topic as well. Okay. I want to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to get review for us real quick, Molly. Where are we with our steps? We had type, we had style. Mm -hmm. um, And then to write the features. We have features. Okay. Stay with us. We're going to come back. We're going to get the next four steps out of Molly. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. Hi, this is T.O.D. Anderson, and I'm the host of Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. We're going to talk about a variety of topics on canine behavior and training, all based on modern methods that are fun for you and your dog. We might be talking about other critters, too. So join us on Get Positive Results. We'll talk about common issues between you and your dog, answer your questions, discuss different activities you can do with your dog, and keep you posted on current canine news and products. All this on Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, and we are back, and uh, we've got with us today Molly Rouse, 
and she's explaining to us the seven step process that she's developed in order to create a program that's going to sell better, make more money. And so we are about to get to step number four. In our last step, we talked about features, which is the stuff. You know, what comes in your training programs? Does it include a leash? Does it include four sessions? Does it include a group session or whatever the case might be? So what is step number four? Step number four is now you write out the benefits of each program. So you look at those features that you came up with for each program. And again, that's what you're actually giving them. But what do they get in the end? What are the benefits or the results that they're going to experience at the end of the program? What will be better? How will their life be different? And you'll go through each of the programs and write a short paragraph that kind of conversationally describes the benefits and the results that they'd see from each program. And then for each larger program, they would highlight how much easier and faster the training will be with that option. So as one example, a lot of times people will, dog trainers will write their program so that it's just, you know, like basic program will teach your dog sit, come, stay, and heal and includes behavior modification for chewing, jumping, and barking and has four lessons. And that's usually how most dog trainers will write their programs. That's just the features. That's not the benefits. That's not the end result. It doesn't really make them feel like they can kind of imagine what their life is going to be like after the dog is trained. So if you write it more like you have the features listed, but you also say things like imagine Imagine your dog being an absolute joy to be around, your family telling you your dog is the most well-behaved dog ever, imagine your dog listening to you every time, not jumping on anyone, always walking right next to you, not chewing or barking like crazy. This is what we do even for your dog. Writing something like that that's conversational and it kind of explains the benefits they're going to get for each program, that would be step four. So the benefits kind of paint a picture is what you're saying. Exactly. I call them imagine statements, but you don't have to use the word imagine, but it kind of just helps them feel like they they know what they're going to get in the end, which is part of making sure that they see the program as much more valuable than maybe a package of just four lessons would be. They can kind of see what's going to happen as the end result. Gotcha. You know, one thing that I've always said, just to kind of interject here, when we're talking about features versus benefits, I always kind of define it as what that means to you. And so I found a lot of people have a hard time kind of understanding the difference between features and benefits. And so I always say that the benefit follows what that means to you. So, you know, you get four sessions. What that means to you is we have a lot of time to work through your problems and and this and that. Or, you know, we give you group sessions. What that means to you is you get to work around other dogs and distractions and things like that. Would you agree with that or would you have a different definition? Right. Yeah. What I always say is a feature is what you're giving them and a benefit is what they give. Yeah. The feature might be like the off command and the benefit is the dog doesn't jump on company anymore and embarrass mm-hmm. them. So it's the end result plus how it affects their lives and how they'd feel about it. So there's some emotional value in there too. What you'd want to focus on more is the end result and the benefits rather than just what you're teaching or how you do it. That's much more important to them, how it will affect them in the end. And you brought up the emotional value. Why is that important? Well, there's a lot of psychology that goes into marketing. And one of the things that's important to remember is that people often will make buying decisions emotionally first, and then later they will try to justify it logically. So they really kind of need to feel what the experience is going to be like in order to be able to be excited about it and decide to spend the money on it, especially if you're charging more than other trainers in the area. So that's why the emotional aspect of pulling those benefits out of your programs and making those clear is really, really important. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I mean, what dog trainer is not going to train your dog to sit or lie down exactly. or, you know, everyone's doing that. And so if that's how they're comparing, why go with you, right? Exactly. Okay. Where are we at now? Step number five? Step number five. Yep. Yeah. Now you would name your programs and you would use names that describe the benefits that they would experience. So rather than just saying basic and advanced, maybe using words like well-mannered or dependable or amazing or dream like that, something that would really just kind of show the value of the program in terms of the benefits again, rather than just being basic and advanced. Why is this important for dog trainers or pet sitters or dog walkers to do? Well, it really just goes back to that emotional thing again. It kind of just shows the benefits rather than just the features, and it kind of tugs at the emotional things again. I want a dependable dog. I want a well-mannered dog. I want a dream dog or an amazing dog rather than just, oh, I just want, you know, basic. Or advanced might even be backfiring on the other direction. They might think, oh, I don't need advanced. I just need my dog to stop jumping. But they might have chosen your advanced program had it just been called amazing dog, you know, just because they are thinking, I don't need advanced, but they do want amazing. You know, so that's kind of, it's a, a lot of it is emotional. 
Gotcha. I don't know about you, but I've found that a lot of folks, they're not terribly familiar with how to even describe what's going on with their dog. And so, you know, I don't know if you've ever had this, but, you know, people call up and they say, you know, I just need the basics. He's trying to attack everybody and, <laughs> you know, murder my guests and he ate the cat. I just need some basics. And it's right. like, what? You don't need basics. You need way more than basics. And so, yeah, oftentimes people don't even know how to describe what they're looking for because they're using what, just the regular language that, that people use about dogs, right? Exactly, yeah. So you you do definitely need to know how people talk and what they say about their dogs and what they say about their problems and kind of work that into your own copy and what you say about your programs and what you write about it because you want to relate to how they feel about their dog and what they think they need and not just what you think they need too. I think that's a great point and I hope people at home are you know taking note of that because I think a lot of dog trainers write out their programs based on themselves, you know. Of course, everyone needs a dog to heal and sit. Well, yeah, they do, but no one goes to a trainer saying, oh, I wish one day my dog will sit. You know, the, anyways, yeah, they're going for, for bigger needs than that typically, right? Right, yeah, it's usually something behavioral, and a lot of times they think it's much worse than it is, like their dogs are driving them crazy because they won't stop play biting or chewing or jumping, and those are all things that most dog trainers can fix very easily, but the owners feel like they've tried everything and nothing has worked. So yeah. a lot of times they feel like they're at the end of their rope and they're not enjoying their dog, and those are the types of things you really want to remember about what's going on in their head. Gotcha. All right, we've got two more, and then after that, I want to make sure we're going through some case studies of stuff that you've seen. But mm -hmm. what's, uh, what's step number six? Step number six is now you price the programs based on how valuable they are to the client and also based on how much time and effort it will typically take you. So you would add up each program to kind of figure out how much it's worth so the prices make sense compared to each other and you get what you're worth for what you're offering. So this is something that is something that I always cover in a lot of detail in programs and courses that I do because you need to know how to price your programs based on how much you feel like you should get for the results that you provide and the results you get with dogs. That's the biggest variable for how much you can charge is the results you get. It's not where you live so much or anything like that. It's more about the results that you get. So you have to figure out how much your programs are worth compared to each other and price them logically that way as well. Gotcha. And so I know this is a vague question, but how, you know, this dog trainer, this pet sitter, this dog walker, they're saying, all right, I got a cool program. It includes a whole bunch of cool stuff. I've named it cool stuff. How are they going to figure out the value of that? Well, one of the things that I teach all my students is the formula for figuring out or calculating the value of a program. But real quick, basically what you do is you figure out how much you believe you should get per hour or maybe per day with a board and train program or something like that based, again, on the results that you get or unique things about you. And some dog trainers feel like they can charge a lot and some dog trainers kind of start lower and then see if everyone's always choosing their largest program, they gradually increase their prices. So it kind of depends on their experience, how long they've been training. I've seen everything from $10 an hour to $300 an hour and more. So it just depends a lot, mostly on the results that you get with dogs and because that's the biggest factor. And then you add up the program features based on the time it would take you and see what it adds up to. And then you add in the value things that you can't really calculate with math. Like if you have unlimited lessons or something like that, they might not ever use very many of them. So you can't really multiply that by math. So you'd have to kind of add in a bit for the perceived value of bonus is like that. And then your programs make sense the way they're priced compared to each other too. You don't have one program that's way more money but doesn't have twice as much stuff in it. Gotcha. Okay. All right. This brings us to the last one. What is step number seven? Step number seven is pretty simple, but it's one that is usually missed by everyone. And now that, that is to test out your results and adjust things as you go along. So you want to test out your programs. Are you attracting more clients with them? If a prospect sees them on your website, are you getting more calls because of that? Are you getting more signups? Are you getting a higher income per client with them? Which programs are they typically choosing on average? Do your prices need to increase or decrease accordingly? Do they think the biggest program includes way more than they need? Or is your largest program the most popular, which might mean the price is too low? So you can change your programs as often as you want, generally, because typically people will only see them each one time. So you can adjust them as much as you really need to till everything seems to be working like a well-oiled machine. So you don't necessarily worry that, all right, I set my price at 1500 
I wasn't getting enough business, so I brought it down to 1,200. You don't necessarily worry that uh, the 1,500 people are going to be angry? No, especially if you're not advertising your prices on your website. They would probably never know that you offered a lower price to someone else later anyway. But you, you do want to be transparent and honest obviously. But if you need to adjust things, typically people will only see what you offer one time anyway. So they're not going to really be following you and seeing if your programs are different now that they've done one, especially if your prices are not listed on your website. Okay. Let's recap real quick. Steps one through seven, we had type, we had style, and I'm not looking at notes here, so I'm, I'm just trying to remember everything. So we had type, we had style, we had features, we had benefits. Mm-hmm. We had, oh, what was step number five? Naming the programs. Naming the programs. Step number six was setting the price. Right. Step number seven was test and adjust. (laughs) Yep. Exactly. Awesome. Let's get into just maybe, you know, the last few minutes here, just a couple kind of case studies. What would you feel comfortable sharing? Maybe it's your business or a client's business. We don't have to use names or anything like that. But, you know, what changing programs has done for, you know, for folks in this industry? Well, I've had a lot of people make these changes and see very, very sudden changes, not only in the number of clients they're attracting because of the way their programs are designed and described on their website. They're getting more calls because people look at them and they say, oh, that program sounds awesome. I want that because Mm -hmm. of just the way it's written and how it's designed. But then they also get more people signing up and for much more money per client. I've had several people who've gone through a workshop or program with me and gone through all of these steps in detail. And then when they set up their programs within two or three weeks after working on that, they would make more money than they had the entire previous year or anything like that. There was there was one person in particular that had that kind of example that she set up her programs. And within three weeks after starting a workshop with me, she'd made $6,000, which was more than she'd made the whole previous year for dog training. So she was just ecstatic because now she knew she could make several thousand dollars every month where previously she was really making nothing. Gotcha. Yeah, and I actually spoke with that person. I know who you're talking about, and she was ecstatic with with the work that you did. <laughs> so, um, but in any case, and so, do you mind sharing a little bit about your programs? Again, we don't have to get into prices or whatnot, but like, what comes in a Molly Rouse program, or you know, stuff like that. Do you mean my my programs for dog trainers, or my programs for dog owners for dog for training? Do- For dog owners, for dog training, yeah. Okay. Um, Basically, there's a few different things that I always tell everyone to keep in mind is you can have all one type of program or you can mix and match the types. So if you wanted to do private lesson programs as your small program and maybe board and train programs for your large program, you can use more than one program type in that style. So some trainers will do all private lesson programs where it might be four lessons would be the smallest program and they would be at your location and your largest program would be six lessons and they'd all be at the owner's home. Mm -hmm. And it might have unlimited group classes afterwards for distractions as a bonus or something like that. And then one program in between. With me personally, I kind of mix up the types a little bit. I have a one-day day day training program where the dog just comes for a day. And then I do lessons with the owner afterwards to train the owner. And then I have a three-day day day training program. And then I have two board and train programs that are four and seven days long each. And those have different bonuses in it. We do a portrait of the dog. We do in-home lessons. We have unlimited commands in that program. So we add in a whole bunch of valuable things that give them a lot of peace of mind for the future. So they they may never use them and they often don't. For example, my biggest program includes unlimited commands. I never have anyone come back to teach an extra command, but they like that when they sign up. They see it as a value. They just never use it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So a lot of things like that are included in the bonuses for my bigger programs too. Awesome. Well, yeah, and and this has been about obviously your system, but I just kind of wanted to echo going into programs and changing how I structure programs is really because I used to be, you know, like like most dog trainers, it's X amount of sessions for X amount of dollars. And then we switched to programs, like I say, I want to say, I want to say four years ago. And it, you know, very quickly doubled our business, you know, got me to where I was able to hire assistant, hire a new trainer, stuff like that. And like I say, just echoing everything you said, people see it differently. You know, suddenly you're different than the other dog trainer that they've been looking at. You offer different things. You provide different results because you're talking about the results versus, you know, the amount of sessions. And so you basically change the conversation that people are kind of having. Yeah. And structure it more based on, you know, what are you going to get? Like you mentioned, you know, versus what am I going to give you type thing? Right. Exactly. Awesome. If folks want to learn more about you or what you do, how do they get in touch? 
There's a couple of ways. One is by going to makeitasadogtrainer.com. That's our primary website there. It has all the information. It's a blog. It has a bunch of free stuff, a bunch of video libraries, free videos that you can watch to help you with marketing your dog training business. We also have the marketing system for dog trainers, which is a CD home study course. It's self-paced and it comes in the mail and you also get online access to it. And that's at marketingsystemfordogtrainers.com. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Molly. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was really fun to be here again. And for those of you at home, if you'd like to listen to any of our other shows or listen to Molly again, just head over to PetLifeRadio.com and click on Six Figure Dog Business. If you have ideas for shows, just email me, Ty at PetLifeRadio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.